I, where we're headed in some coordinated way. And what I would argue is there's been a lot of good work done, and I'll touch on some of that here shortly, but I think in many ways as a conservation community, we're disoriented. And this is for a number of reasons. The past is no longer precedent, and by what I mean by that is that looking at historical reference conditions no longer they're either impractical to attain in most cases, at best, at worst, they're maybe entirely irrelevant because our future is so uncertain in the context of climate change, in the context of development, population growth, invasive species. Those targets that we used to look back at achieving are just maybe not very possible and not even all that informative to guide us a clear message of where we want to go that underlies this effort, our Bobolink effort, and many others. And certainly as we start to assemble the many different species plans that are out there and try and look at things through those lenses, it becomes very complicated and coherency is a difficult thing to achieve and, and certainly a long-term process. You can look at our, our surrogate species technical guidance, and this I think is a, an example of kind of how we see this nebulous thing that we want to accomplish yet defining it is very difficult in part due to there being so many moving parts. Functional landscapes on which these surrogate species we're working towards uh, as metrics of success for conservation. Uh, capturing this notion of functional landscapes is defined as lands and waters with the properties and elements required to support desirable populations of fish and wildlife while also providing humanity with desirable <coughs> goods and services, including food, water, fiber, energy, and living space. So basically, we want it all, right? We want this balance, and yet how to define that in the space of competing benefits, it's a very difficult problem. And so I want to talk a little bit about how maybe we move down the road of uh, making some progress in this regard. So to dig a little further into this, okay, how much is enough? That really underlies a lot of the issues that we face today. And after two days in our Bobolink working group, we're still sort of trying to develop, okay, how much is enough? We talk about keeping a common bird common. You know, we're not, we're not falling back to this minimum viable population. We want something more than that. We're not really looking back at some historical standard. We're kind of in this gray area of trying to define our values in the context of what's an acceptable level of risk. What are those competing trade-offs that we have to talk about, okay, if we're gonna work on one species here, it may come at the cost of another species there or elsewhere. And certainly, in the context of what's practical, what we have funding to do, what's politically feasible, there's a whole array of trade-offs. And so, how to answer this question, how much is enough, is something that's rarely done, in my opinion, in a very compelling way. We can get behind this as a bobbling group, or as a Henslow Sparrow group, <coughs> and maybe we can get behind it as a grassland bird community push it further as a conservation community. But can we get further in trying to define something that really garners support even more broadly for a concept or a vision that's coherent of landscape design that describes that definition of functional landscapes that I showed you previously? So what's the problem? Joint ventures have offered uh, population <coughs> objectives largely based on PIF objectives. A lot of work has been done on this that's good work, and it's set the stage really well for where we are now, but I, I think we're at a point where we really need some critical thought and discussion on, on how these things work in time and in space, making sure that different objectives align in realistic ways, and that we start looking at costs and make sure we're realistic and appropriately ambitious at the same time about what we're demanding. You know, we're talking about lines in the sand here in many ways, or organizing visions that try to garner support of a broad constituency in the policy arena, ultimately. 
So one example of this recently that, that I've been involved with and, and that demonstrates a little bit about what we're struggling with in applying this sort of thing is, okay, we're zooming in here to the eastern tall grass prairies, Big River LCC, the, the red boundary that you see on this map, large area, highly altered agricultural landscape, and of the 21 species that were selected as good ecological umbrella species in this landscape, we see four species of birds here. And when we look, dig deeper into the population estimates and population objectives of these species, we find that, okay, Henslow sparrows, we think we've got so many, the objective, maintain that population. Similarly for grasshopper sparrows, similarly for bobolink in this landscape based on the PIF estimates and objectives in this BCR. Upland sandpiper based on the, the JV plans, well, we think we have 30,000, we want 40,000. Now yeah, there's, there's other species, there's waterfowl that are selected, there's a bunch of fish, but when we talk about what we want to envision in this landscape for grassland birds, is that sufficiently captured by increasing 10,000 upland sandpipers? Are we satisfied with our vision for restoration of this landscape with maintaining those populations of grassland birds? Maybe, but probably not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an effort I've been working on for a few years related to trying to develop more of an integrated vision for conservation at a, at a finer scale and looking at some of the, the balancing acts here and what they really mean and what it entails to address this issue in a more specific kind of way. And this is a, a broad partnership of all the agencies you see here and organizations you see here and, and others as well, and, and it's ongoing. So the framework we approach this with is in many ways, uh, Gwen's work is working towards a similar end at a broader scale. But what we're really after here is trying to evaluate spatial priorities for wildlife, water quality, as well as flood reduction in our case, and doing that in the context of agricultural productivity. And what we start with here is defining clear metrics of success. And we move from those into where is the best place to achieve those respective metrics, right? That's the easiest part, rather than getting into quantitative outcomes from the get-go or setting population objectives, although it's an iterative process, and I'll get to that. But really, what we're talking about is a spatial index of priorities for what we want. And getting clear about that, coming to the table from a wildlife standpoint, from a bird standpoint, and then reaching out to our partners and saying, here's what we want, what do you want, or at least, where are your most important areas to achieve the things you think you want? From there, let's get serious about modeling outcomes from various alternative strategies that relate to these spatial priorities. And then we get into, okay, what's it gonna cost to do these things? And ultimately, that's going to inform our objectives for each respective metric at the get-go there and answer this question of how much is enough, at least. That's how we are envisioning this process. And it's very much related to the SHC cycle, complementary to it, I would argue, but a bit of a, a little bit of a different way of looking at it. And you can see our grassland bird conservation strategy mapping effort really informing our spatial priorities there, which would then get us back to this notion of, okay, what do we want to say? How much is enough for bobolinks, et cetera? So where we zoomed in for our, our pilot study, first attempt at this effort is uh, the Buffalo River watershed in Minnesota. It's uh, near Fargo, the 94 corridor cuts up uh, through the, these counties here. And this is the your Red River Valley, very flat, flood-prone area, highly productive agriculture, moving up into a strip of more habitat that is the remnant ridge area, and then there's some more uh, woodland type habitat, refuge lands, wetter areas as you get into the upper portions of this watershed. Now I don't have a lot of time today to get into the details, and I'm happy to talk with anyone later about some more specifics, but what we've done is, thus far we don't have surrogate species from our agency selected in this area, so we've drawn from the metrics of success.
success in our Minnesota Prairie Plan, applied some models that we have, uh, developed, you know, our group, the Hackett Office, has spatial abundance estimating uh, models for most of these species, not, we actually don't have a pheasant model, but uh, for, for the most part, the others we do have. And so we use those to work through a process of prioritization for uh, wildlife restoration and mostly geared at in this effort towards a restoration type prioritization and design. And we also uh, can incorporate these grassland bird conservation area models that we've developed in the past in working with PIF. And we can zoom in. Some of our partners have other priorities. You know, we can ad adapt to this in a lot of different this is an example of TNC-led efforts to look at prairie con native prairie connectivity in the context of uh, grazing cooperative uh, options and so forth. So we're taking our wildlife models, we're trying to streamline those and integrate those, which is kind of a subset of problems in its own right. Then we're also reaching out to uh, some of our partners to look at some of the hydrologic modeling, okay? So in the same landscape, breaking it out by sub-watersheds, where are our flood reduction priorities, and this is something they haven't really done a lot of in the past. Um, you know, they're, they're coming like we did not so long ago from very opportunistic type of realm. And now we have increasing capacity through LIDAR-based digital elevation <coughs> models to really get serious about, okay, how, how much flooding is expected, where is it coming from? Uh, we can break it down by sub-watersheds, catchments, which would be even finer than these. And we can associate these different sub-watersheds with peak flow flood events at the, the main stem outlet of this watershed and use that to start to prioritize, okay, if we're going to do upland and wetland restoration actions, where do we want to do them to try and reduce these flooding events? And those can be oriented at different scales in, the, in that system as well. Similarly, we can look in finer detail at even field level contributions to sediment, nitrates, phosphorus impacts, and these types of things to really highlight where these priority areas are, okay? And it should be noted, a lot of our holdup has been for them to kind of work through some additional modeling, these digital elevation models, the LIDAR stuff, to be accurate, to get us to the outcome estimates that would compare or complement our wildlife stuff it takes a lot of work, they have to burn in the culverts and things, a lot of you are probably aware of that, and that's been one big limitation. Lastly, there's crop productivity index data available through NRCS that highlights where are our greatest agricultural productivity potential areas based on soil quality and properties and moisture gradients in the landscape. So we know where your best ground is to grow corn, basically we can try and avoid that as part of this. So we're working through some optimization work again. We're, I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but we're using a software package called Zonation, and working with some of our partners, Paul Radomsky at the Minnesota DNR, is leading a portion of this work. It allows us to look at integrating those different objectives in an optimization framework, spatially highlighting where those shared priorities are, looking at how that changes if we try and shift away from high cost or high agricultural productivity areas to a different type of landscape design prioritization scheme, which then you can use to plug in to look at the outcomes that we might can achieve in comparison to different alternative prioritization schemes. Another way you can think about this, another way you can look at this, we're now working uh, really closely with the Natural Capital Project at the University of Minnesota, and uh, they're based out of Stanford, but there's a growing contingent in, in Minnesota as well. And they use this uh, GIS-based platform of INVEST for optimization. And so we can look at different landscape designs here, all geared at looking at uh, sediment reduction. <coughs> basically, what would it cost to achieve a 25%, a 50%, a 75%, 100% reduction in sediment in this particular watershed? most efficiently, this is kind of your efficiency horizon curve, and where do other strategies fall within uh, different buffer strips and prioritizations fall within that. We can start to look at things, in this case for sediment, but we can also start to then run our models respectively. You know, if we can come to
to a shared work plan on some of these different options. What we're talking about here is essentially adding conservation units to our conservation estate, right? Increased restoration as we move down the x-axis here. And depending on the prioritization scheme we're working on and using outcome-based models, so keep in mind every single point on these curves would be one model run for that particular outcome. Say we want to look at bottling population and what our particular strategy would produce for water quality targets, nitrates in the watershed, or flood reduction, right? We can tweak those dials, which would tweak our, our landscape design, which would change the nature of these curves. But what we can start to do then is evaluate what it would take to achieve any targets we've established at the scale. If we don't have those targets established, what we can start to do is look at how much it would cost to achieve whatever improvement, what the relative benefits would be, or the respective collateral benefits from any one strategy. And we can either identify how much is possible, start to talk about more meaningfully about the trade-offs, things that may otherwise appear not realistic. So in conclusion, you know, something magical may happen if we can collectively narrow in on the shared systematic vision based on ecosystem services that begins by being clear about what we want and what the metrics are to evaluate that bringing additional partners on board and trying to look at this as a functional system. So it's not really necessarily about a plan or a map, although it may start with that, but ultimately about the shared motivation and coordination. What we believe happens is that we get value-added results, right? Greater efficiency from any given project because we're pooling a lot of different types of activities, a lot of different money sources towards common ends, or at least complementary ends, and leveraging those together. Also promoting greater coordination, even if it's just simply in terms of focal areas to begin with. And that broader constituency really means greater political leverage. It means you have grassroots level support at this scale for people coming at this from a lot of different angles out there, advocating for these priority areas, framing what they're after out there to reduce floods and saying, this flood reduction is going to be benefiting not only our community and the economics of the flooding impacts, but it's going to be producing this many bobolinks, this many mallards are going to be supported by this effort, and vice versa. When we go to county boards, they want to know not so much how many mallards we're producing, they want to know how does this project contribute to the flood reduction targets of our county. So no matter what your objective is, it's increasingly necessary to, to translate that into objectives that others have set. Grassland birds on their own may not be that compelling when you get too far outside this room. So we really need to think about how to message this. And I think one way to do that is to start to integrate these spatial models that are emerging from different arenas. And with that broader constituency, uh, much more is possible than what's been done in the past. And I think a, a vision is really there to motivate our society and start to really promote a new way of looking at this whole land ethic and functional landscapes as part of that. It's not easy in conclusion here. There are, there's many technical challenges to do this well, on the modeling side and, and as well as the logistics side, getting people behind it, uh, the leadership that we need to make this sort of thing happen is uh, very unique because it's beyond, you know, we, in wildlife, we work towards wildlife. In our government, we live in siloed programs. There are not these institutional bureaucratic mechanisms to cause this integration to happen, and that's a big part of the problem. It's agriculture, it's wildlife, it's water and flood. Everybody's kind of doing their own thing. They're mandated to work towards a specific object objective in many cases. And so this, this integration takes some creativity and it takes you know, individuals who are interested in pursuing this as much as anything. So this is really not a, not a traditional way of doing business by any means, but maybe it'll inspire some of you to, to think about how we can continue to work in this direction. So there's a lot of folks that have been involved in this so far. Uh, Farm, USDA Farm Service Agency has provided some funding <coughs> to help support this effort. They're very interested in seeing uh, bridges
bridging some of these gaps in agricultural conservation programs and wildlife outcomes. And like I said, the Natural Capital Project has been doing uh, some additional work with us on optimization and economic model. So just a, a quote to throw up there that I often fall back on that I think maybe captures uh, the challenges ahead of us for this group in the near future. There's a lot of information out there. It's about what to do with it and how to bring it all together in a meaningful way. So with that, I'll, if there's time, I'll take questions. Yep, there's time for sure. Thanks. say we've directly incorporated any social surveys uh, other than just simply assuming that that crop productivity index is a, going to capture some of their concerns and that we're really doing the best we can in our design to avoid highly productive areas, which we know is an issue, but certainly it's more complicated than that. Another thing that's been talked about with the invest modeling group than at CAP folks is looking at social demands, you know, where do we need the flood reduction benefits that, to benefit people most? Uh, where do we need recreation op opportunities and some of those kind of more subtle things? And we are thinking about that, but thus far it's been kind of a somewhat more simple, although I don't know that simple is very, very good, having worked on this for a few years, but, uh, you know, it's more of a, a proof of concept program. Brian, the um, Northeast Climate Science Center has funded a project that will start very soon for the, the Midwest LCCs that will look at social capacity for adoption of these practices. And that you've identified a gap that they're trying to, to address, and that's the map where, where grassland birds need to be, or we can map where water quality is degraded, but we can't yet map social capacity for adoption and conservation practices. So where are the where are the technical assistance resources the highest and where are the landowners most willing to adopt practices and why? So they are in the world. Yeah, and I would <coughs> add to that, you know, one of the things that was something I learned from our SDM workshop at, at NCTC, or maybe that I'm reflecting on it even after the fact, was that we need that social science information, and often that takes the forms of these surveys and things. I don't feel like it's often been translated in spatial context, the results of that social science information. And I think that's one message that we need to carry forward to really make that meaningful. We need to map out, we need them to translate that and bridge this, okay, so what are decisions are people making and why, and how do we translate that into mapping it out and seeing where those opportunities are? Because until we can do that, it's it's very hard for us to use in those cases. I'm involved in a similar project in the watershed in Indiana. And one way that we approach this problem here is that we try to model showing certain things showing benefits to the farmers. So specifically how differences in water storage with wetland restoration would be a benefit. So that's a way in which we also run sort of optimizations or scenario we play scenarios with landscape that can show scale and say you're losing money by not putting this part of your your tract into a conservation land use and here's the payments you'd get 
and so on. That's a, a very compelling thing to be able to do. Right? So one of, one of the things that you're talking about is, um, is sort of being more explicit about the declaration of what the scope is of our commons. The, the commons, in this case, are the, our bird communities, our grassland components, the waters that are on the landscape. The commons governance is a critical issue that um, is oftentimes legalistically um, required to, to, to enforce. I mean, you, you can't you can't enter into common governance uh, unless you're in a small community setting, just willing, you know, just getting everybody to do so willingly. I mean, you have to impose laws. Those laws declare what are your rights as well as your responsibilities. And so, to some extent, this is to, to do these sort of integration requires. Uh, imposing responsibilities upon the community, the, the, the folks in the community. And th this is going to require landowners to, to be subject to responsibilities that, that, that they're not currently subject to. Are you, are you guys thinking about these sorts of issues from a commons, a, a commons governance perspective? You hit some important points there. I mean, we are, most certainly. There's it can be an act effort of regulation, it can be incentivization, it can be market-based solutions. There's different options for how you would change those curves or set constraints on those curves, low-end constraints, for example. But, uh, you know, that's a whole topic on its own. But it looks like maybe we should move on, or? I think we should move on, but I think that's a good conversation to continue in uh, the free time that we'll have at lunch. And, um, it seems like you identified the need for some political audiences for your results. And, could carry out the kind of